Hey everyone, Yan Zhao. Tonight, the famous, or perhaps infamous, the Dungeon Delver has returned to bring us his gaming knowledge. A lot of old school fans, new school fans. You start getting into gaming, you play, then you say, you know what? I want a shot. And you DM a few one shots, and you look at it and you say, you know what? I could make my own campaign. Well, what do you do? So, Dungeon Delver. Yes. Good evening, all you fun people out there in internet land. Uh, so, what do you think? What is the first thing people should do when they decide, you know, I'm going to take the plunge and I'm going to make my own campaign? Um, steal. <laughs> we, if, if you're playing... Whatever game you're playing, you've read something in that genre. You have absorbed that media through something. Nobody is born uh, and their first words are Dungeons and Dragons. At least I don't think so. I could be wrong. Um, you read a book, you see a movie, uh, a TV show, uh, a comic book. Um, maybe you know somebody who's doing fantasy-based beat poetry, and that's how you get it. But the point is our ideas that lead us down the road to role-playing games come from somewhere. And all of those sources can be harvested for ideas. Don't think that you have to be a nascent George R.R. R. Martin or better J.R.R. R. Tolkien. Um, don't feel like you must be a master campaign creator out of the box borrow stuff from everywhere uh you know and and the more eclectic as long as it fits the better of course it's very dependent on what game we're talking about if we're talking about mm -hmm. dungeons and dragons run the gamut crib stuff from from Tolkien, from Martin, from Andre Norton, from Fritz Leiber, from Paul Anderson. Just, just drink it all in. Create a great melange of ideas. And the better ones that you have will rise to the top and they will resonate with you more. And you'll discard certain other ones that don't seem to fit your worldview. But don't be afraid to borrow ideas even ideas from other role-playing game products or even other products in the same um, in the same neighborhood of of what you're doing. You may not want to run a world of Greyhawk campaign. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty of areas and locales in the world of Greyhawk that you can file the serial numbers off of. And create interesting locations for your um, for your for your campaign. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, and don't burden yourself with the idea that you do have to reinvent the wheel. That your campaign has to be out of the box, something completely other than than else. And I mean, by borrowing ideas from other products, I mean, I don't mean like, oh, okay, well. There's a village of Hamlet in my campaign world. Just take the map. You know, sometimes just starting with a map of a town can be the most useful thing in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. we could probably stack the number of three ring binders full of campaign notes <laughs> uh, that all started to keep on the borderlands and evolved into their own unique worlds at the hands of dungeon masters. Uh, and that stack would go from here to the moon. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. I think, um, well, my first thing you should do, I would say, pick a theme or topic. Like, figure out what kind of game you want to play, because that'll give you a lot of direction. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you want, like, a horror campaign, if you want, like, more of a Tolkienian, good versus evil, or maybe you want, like... Uh, a bunch of zany adventures with goofballs in it. 
Um, to me, it seems like you want to start there, and you're absolutely right. Start picking those things off from all the different things that you like. Um, one thing I have seen, which is kind of weird, I think, but I've seen some people who make campaigns that they kind of don't like their own campaign. You know, like they sure. they they skip that step where it seems like, oh, well, I'm doing a Dungeons and Dragons thing, so there's got to be a dragon or, you know, something that they're not that into. Whereas the most fun ones to me seem more like people who start amusing themselves and then because it's something you find interesting that really translates to players and they become interested in it. Sure. And I think, um, I, I, I think, uh, a lot of it can be dependent on what you're playing. Um, there's, there is a wealth of ideas that can be found just by picking up an atlas. For example, if you're running um, Twilight 2000, that is one of my favorite role-playing games that's not D&D. Um, Twilight 2000 is, of course, a, uh, a game that takes place in the middle of a slowly grinding down Third World War after the nukes have flown but there's still bits and pieces of armies beating each other to death on the uh, irradiated battlefields uh, of the earth. Um, and, you know, you can decide whether your unit wants to go full Mad Max or, or try and accomplish a mission and fight your way back to NATO lines or, or what have you. Um, look at Google Maps and look at Central Europe and then pick, okay, which cities do I think would have gotten flattened by conventional weapons or nukes? You know, um, would these bridges be here? Would this farm be there? And so on and et cetera. Uh, another great campaign method. Um, and again, it's game specific, but I, I, I think it's, uh, I, I think it's, it's uh, pretty awesome actually. Uh, the game is, is uh, Tales from the Loop. Oh, yeah. Um, and Tales from the Loop is uh, is from um, Free League. Well, Tales from the Loop, its campaign setting is one of two places. It is the American Southwest in 1982 in kind of a suburb, uh, medium-sized town slash city suburb, or it's in uh, Sweden, in 1982. Now I know nothing about Sweden, but I know a hell of a lot about the American suburbs in 1982. <laughs> and when I sat down and I started reading Tales from the Loop, I loved the concept, but the campaign, I was just like, I'm not going to set my campaign in this made up fictional Southwestern American town. So, well, I, I've lived in Central Florida for 40 plus years. I lived here when the neighborhood that I grew up in was a sleepy 1980s style suburb. So literally all I had to do was take the tales from the loop, uh, the, the technology and the um, 14 events that go on in the world of tales from the loop and lay them over my own memories. So when I told my characters, Yes, you buy your comics at the 7-Eleven that's across the street from Evans High School. You cut class to go to Game Street USA, the video arcade. Um, you buy your role-playing games and other comic books that you can't get at 7-Eleven at Duga's Books, which is just up Silver Star Road. I know all those places. I grew up there. I, you know, I have a very clear mental image of what that has to be. But with science fiction and fantasy unless you were really doing some fun stuff in college, you don't really have, you know, the idea of, you know, yes, I know exactly where the dragons and the orcs live. Right. right so right. that's, that's when you go back to lifting ideas, appropriating ideas from, from uh, other sources and, and helping make your world pop. There's no shame in using that. 
as a jumping off point for, for your campaigns. Again, even if it's just a map, even if you just take the village of Hamlet, strip out every non-player character and so on, you just start with a map and you can go from there. Um, so some people, I think, get a little carried away with the map things. So I agree with you. How big of a map do you think you should make? Uh, because I've seen people say, okay, I've got this Hamlet. Oh, well, this Hamlet, it's really in a province. So I need the map for the province. And then, well, if I do the province, it's got to be for the country. So then they want to do for a country. And then they say, oh, but, uh, you know, it's in this world. And, well, my world has multiple planes of existence. And so, like, how do you, what's the the sweet spot for, let's say, a first timer starting a new campaign? Like, okay, I got this part down. I should move on to something else. Um, start simple, start small. Um, the, the, the sweet spot is, uh, really what, what you're comfortable dealing with. You know, uh, my Wednesday night co-host, uh, Kyle Schumann and I have, talked on many occasions about populating a hex typically a world map in a campaign um if it has that kind of that degree of structure and you're not basing something on the real world or you're just like okay you go up this highway or you know you go through this neighborhood um you know it, it'll be based on on a hex grid map outside Mm -hmm. Um, and the basic unit on that map is a hexagon. Well, depending on how big your hexagons are, you may have your hands full. Now you might think, oh, well, a 30 mile across hex, that's not that big. Um, mm -hmm. a 30 mile hex would encompass most of the county in Florida that I live in and, uh, at least North to South. And I think about all the stuff I could, quote unquote, encounter all of the, quote unquote, non-player characters that could be in a 30 mile hex. Um, you've got a lot of filling in to do. So start small. Your players might say, yeah, we want to join the caravan train to go from uh, to, to go from, uh, you know, New Lutherville to Otisburg. But. And, and you know that 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 may be a month long journey, but they're going to have to spend a while hiking around the locale, and that's where games like AD and D, I'm you know going to uh, preach what I know. Um, you know, AD and D has a magnificent system of determining what might be in a given area. Of a hex, and even if you don't play, if if you know, if you think no, I you know, I play Pathfinder, I play Fifth Edition. Do yourself a favor and pick up the First Edition AD and D Dungeon Master's Guide, even if it's only the PDF. You know, you can ignore hit points and monster traits and that sort of thing. Start filling your hex with the random tables from there, and you will be amazed at how diverse and how populous you can make a simple quote unquote 30 mile hex with just a few die rolls. Um, so using tools like that can be a huge, huge help. Hmm. Um, you know, I think you're right. I think we can uh, definitely aid in D one <clears throat> and some of the other older uh, RPGs in general have really sort of a, a font of knowledge uh, that, you know, I think a little bit gets stripped away in every subsequent generation. Um, so do you, what do you think about using pre-made adventures, uh, using those as part of your homebrew? So, for oh, example, I, I, a pre-made module that you just plug into your setting. Oh, I think it's absolutely vital. I think, I, I think it's... Um, it's so much busy work that can be taken off your hands. Now, I, 
I very much believe, and this this has been my bully pulpit for a while, though, that a a properly managed module is not one you just strip the plastic off the cover of and start running the minute you sit down at the table with the players. Um, even at tournaments, they'll give a dungeon master a while to absorb what's in the module. So if you're plugging it into your campaign world, all of the classic AD&D modules say, um, you know, you may want to alter or adjust this to fit your campaign. Um, you know, you might really love the Desert of Desolation series, which is set in the Forgotten Realms universe. But you love the world of Greyhawk. So do you not play in the world of Greyhawk campaign world, which I'm getting a little bit ahead. We'll talk about prepackaged campaign <laughs> worlds at the appropriate time. But um, well, let's say your campaign world. Do you ditch your campaign world to play in Forgotten Realms because you like these models? Goodness, no. Just adjust them accordingly. You know, just if they say that you're in this adventure because the king of so-and-so land has demanded you rescue princess what's her name but you don't have so and so land and you know princess what's her name doesn't factor into your uh, into your campaign adjust those things throw them out but you can still use the modules you're not going to make uh, the the ghost of gary gygax cry if you put the village <laughs> of hamlet or keep on the borderlands or against the giants or tomb of horrors or any of those in your own campaign setting and adjust to make them fit your campaign setting. Hmm. Um, and so where do you, where do you think are good places to get sort of these modules? Uh, if people wanted to buy them. Classic AD and D modules uh, you can find at um well, actually, you can get the, the gamut of D&D modules uh, all the way from stuff released for original Dungeons & Dragons by third-party publishers because a uh, little bit of trivia, TSR never officially released an adventure module for original D&D. Really? Yes. Judges Guild and uh, We Warriors and a few other third-party companies released it. And to, to Gary's ire, I should point out. He, he thought that was cheapening the brand, that third-party companies were not uh, would not do right by what he considered the quality of of D and D and later A D and D. Also, it was the thought of TSR that nobody would want somebody else to do their own thinking for them. Every DM <laughs> worth his salt would want to design his own dungeons and design his own campaign worlds, and that they were kind of a dead end product for a type of gamer that they didn't really want to attract. And then of course, judges guild started making money hands over fist with the, uh, with, <laughs> with their campaign models that they released. So TSR got on that really quick. Um, but if you go to DMS guild, you can search from OD and D up to uh, fifth edition and you can find all kinds of, of adventures now in thinking about other genres science fiction um most uh most uh classic role-playing games have seen a bit of a renaissance in that uh even some of the more obscure ones not the most obscure ones though there's a few that sadly i have not seen in pdf form uh but most classic uh, role-playing games have seen a PDF re-release of their original stuff. So you can pick up at drive through RPG. Um, you can pick up Classic Traveler, Twilight 2000, um, even some TSR stuff that's not on DM's Guild, uh, Boot Hill, Gamma World, Star Frontiers, uh, I think only the ones that really get tied up in IP disputes. Uh, like I don't know that there's any Wizards of the Coast, or for that matter, uh, uh, West End Games 
Star Wars material available there, but I could be wrong. I've never gone looking for it. Um, I always figured Star Wars was a big enough universe that I could just make some shit up and <laughs> it would it would work. Uh, you know, there there's Jedi and the planet is shaped like a donut. Okay, that's that's what's happening. Um, but all of those sites for a song, you can put your hand on great adventure modules to plug into your campaign world if you need to spice it up. And a lot of those things are just even if you don't want to run against the giants, the plot for against the giants and then descent into the depths of the earth and then queen of the demon web pits is good enough that it should fire your imagination. You know, even if you're like, man, Gygax sucks, but this is, this is some great ideas I've got here. You know, even mm -hmm. if that's that, that's your takeaway. Are you read, um, you know, the, uh, something like for twilight 2000 like uh the um armies of the night which is set in a post-apocalypse new york city um you might not like what they did with it but it might spark your imagination you might think well if this is what a city in a post-nuke america is like but not a city that that got nuked is per the canon twilight 2000 timeline New York City actually did not get hit with a nuclear weapon. Not that you would know it from the conditions in this city uh, <laughs> three years after the nukes flew. Um, imagine uh, Barter Town from, uh, from uh, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, but with many hundreds of thousands of residents. Um, nice. But that might fire your imagination also. There's, there's just a wealth of good module resources out there. And you might be a cross genre person. I mean, one of the most beloved modules for advanced Dungeons and Dragons set in the world of Greyhawk is S3, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks. What is it? It's a module that takes place on a crashed spaceship. There's robots, laser guns, powered armor, aliens, the works. So you might find something that you're that, that you think, okay, what if the USS Enterprise crash landed on my home campaign world? Well, there's S3. You can take S3 and see, you know, what what might uh, what might fit. Hmm. Um, so, do you have any of your own products on one of those sites? Uh, Drive Through RPG has a few things that I've written. Um, let me, you know. I, I I didn't bring a pencil. I'm sorry. I didn't know there'd be a quiz. <laughs> it's all right. Let me see. Uh, right through RPG, and I think let's see. I wish I could find the person at Drive Through RPG who who wrote their their search engine because it it doesn't. It brings up, like, I have to scroll through a bunch of weird stuff. It, just the lost crypt. Why isn't it there? So I'm going to, I'm going to paste this in StreamYard and you can. Uh, All right. You you can. I'll so, put that up there. there I, I think it's probably the same guy who does the search feature and uh, user interface for Amazon Prime. Oh, yeah. No kidding. That, the poof. Uh, so. So that's the Lost Crypt. Um, let me see if I can find another one. That's from uh, Frog God Games. Um, here's another one that I wrote. This is uh, published through my buddies over at Hellebard. This is Temple of the Sun. And let me... Let me see if I can find. There we go. And that is Elemental Moon. Elemental Moon, I wrote under a pen name for reasons that are too stupid to go into here. Um, <laughs> maybe if I had a couple more beers, I would launch into it, but I'm, I'm going to be polite and not. But uh, those are three modules that I picked up that you can put anywhere. And the portability of modules is shown nowhere 
more clearly than it is in Temple of the Sun. I wrote Temple of the Sun to be in the world of Greyhawk. I never intended to sell it, and it was well before Wizards of the Coast was a little bit more friendly. I mean, when I self-published my own kitchen sink PDFs mocked up to look like classic AD&D modules for the AD&D rule set, even though there was an OGL, I told everybody who visited my website, you know, I put it as plain as day in the text where you could download the modules. If Wizards of the Coast says, take these down, they're gone for good. If I get a legal CND from them, that's it, they're gone. But I gave Temple of the Sun over to Don over at Hellebard, and he said, you know, what if we de Greyhawkified this and I put it in my company's default campaign setting? Would you be okay with that? And I said, absolutely. So there you go. And it, it's the same with the Lost Crypt. The Lost Crypt was part of a module that I wrote with Gary Gygax, uh, which unfortunately the larger module I don't think will ever be published. But the module takes place in a demiplane hmm. that is accessible through the bottom level of Castle Greyhawk. Well, I very carefully detached all the cables and struts and and support mountings and everything that that fit it so nicely into that module and it's completely separate from that now so there's two examples of things that i've written that i myself excised from their original material so they will work in other campaigns that makes sense. Uh, so what do you think is a good ratio for somebody who's new um, to run a campaign? The ratio of pre take borrowing parts from pre-made campaigns versus homebrew. Like, do you think it should be, you know, just run for your first campaign ever, just run a complete campaign uh, that's pre-made or, and then of course you modify as you go along uh, or is it like, 50-50, Well, I, I'll tell you, I, I've I, I've never made it uh, a secret of how much I love uh, the Greyhawk campaign setting. Um, but if you, if you pick up the World of Greyhawk set, you'll notice that there are a few cities here and there. The the source books for the world itself are actually fairly lightweight. What gets filled in that massive, massive map by uh, uh, Darlene Peekle is entirely up to you. You can go through one hex at a time, rolling on the charts in the World of Greyhawk set and in the Dungeon Master's Guide to people every hex. You're going to be here a while if you decide to do that. But, but there's very little stuff that is pre-done for the dungeon masters guy i would say based on your ratios uh that it is probably a 20 percent complete campaign world hmm. and i call it 35 percent, and then 65 percent is just howling wilderness and i think that i i think if you get a pre-made campaign like forgotten realms or world of greyhawk or uh, something like, um, our, you know, a, a campaign that's based around Arkham, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. um, for Call of Cthulhu. Uh, your best campaigns will have the broad strokes done and then leave the cool little details for you, the, uh, the, the, the DM, the referee, the GM, the keeper to fill in yourself. I mean, one of Judges Guild's most, beloved products was city state of the invincible overlord and the capital city is this gargantuan map that is effectively blank it's up to you to figure out what's in that tiny little you know quarter inch wide by three quarter inch long um blank spot on the map you know it has 21 on it and then in the book there's just 21 and enough space to write something in and that's it 
-hmm. you've got it. You've got a city map and it's keyed, but what goes in those keys is up to you. And I think that is an excellent exercise for the imagination of, of the, the DM to keep things fresh, to keep the ideas in their brain going. And on the flip side, it really helps the DM avoid gotchas. And what I mean by that is a lot of dungeon masters, I feel, will find themselves fettered to the word on the page, feeling that they can't change what's there because, you know, Sandy Peterson wrote this, Mark Miller wrote this, Gary Gygax wrote this. Who am I? You know, I'm just, a, I'm just learning to play this. I'm sure they put this there for a reason. So I, I'm just going to leave it like it is or worse. You would change it, but because everything's all done, Hey, everything's cool and makes sense. You know, you find something really egregious that screws up your campaign and, and wrecks your fun. I mean, and, and that goes all the way down to modules, which is why I always say you have to read and prepare for modules and alter them as you see fit. You might want to run the Tomb of Horrors, but you might want to run the Tomb of Horrors so that it's more suitable for a party of 5th to 7th level characters or 5th to 8th level characters. So suddenly the four-armed uh, um, gargoyle that, that can hit four times for up to 10 points of damage in a single round, you might want to make that a normal gargoyle, mm -hmm. you know, um, and delete the infamous green devil face with a sphere of annihilation in it that parties just seem hell bent on running into, you know, it's Definitely. so with regard back to the broader campaign, um, a campaign setting if you're getting a pre-made one that leaves something that leaves you the game master, some wiggle room is the best one in my opinion. So, um, so we got a little bit of the background on the world. How do you start building stories and story arcs? Well, that can, that can, can, it can come from a few different ways. Um, now, true confession, I want you to have a big listener base, but I hope none of my players are listening right now. <laughs> um, one of my favorite AD&D &D modules is uh, S4, Lost Caverns of Sojkonth. Um, it is a magnificent... Uh, some people will call it a mega dungeon. It's a two level dungeon. Um, but the, 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 one of the things that makes it great isn't the dungeon. It's finding where it is. It's spending potentially days or weeks traipsing through a mountain range and having all these encounters. But as you read, as you, the, the dungeon master read the module text beforehand, and Gary even says, you got to read this beforehand. You got to prepare. You got to do your homework. Um, you learn that there are different kingdoms very near the area where you're exploring, you know, like three separate kingdoms come together and you learn about the, 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 the kingdom of Ket, the kingdom of Perrin land. Um, and, and other locations and then you have to take in, in, into consideration if, uh, you know, if if the king of Bissell gives you uh, a writ to to go in and to find the uh, oh yeah S four um, gives you a writ to go in and find the treasures in the fabled lost caverns of Sojkamp, that might not be something the Kettites or the Perrinlanders would want you to do, or if you found them, would want you to turn them over to them. So suddenly, random encounters with wandering patrols expands out the political repercussions from your characters simply looking for a dungeon. And what they say and what they do, you might say, yes, we're from, you know, the Grand March, and we're here seeking, you know, and the patrol 
considers this and they leave you. And then weeks later, the parent landers, you know, the, the powers that be in parent land are enraged. Why is the far off grand March sending an armed band into our country? I mean, you know, think about it. If you were just driving around your neighborhood and there's 30 or 40 armed guys just marching along and there's a, Oh yeah, we're from, uh, you know, we're, we're from, you know, we're, we're, we're from France. We just, we just thought we'd come here. Uh, you know, we, the, the mayor of Paris told us it was okay if we came here and, uh, and sought valuable antiques. You, that would give you pause, I think, um, mm -hmm. as well as the local police. And, you know, it, it would get escalated up and that's how you can grow, uh, your world is simple encounters. Um, it, consider B2, the keep on the borderlands, the classic model. Well, what's it on the borderlands of? Is it near, a, you know, obviously it's between, it's a border between law and chaos, but might it be near something else? Might it be, you know, near another kingdom, uh, you know, that maybe they're, they're doing the devil's arithmetic and saying, well, you know, we're, we're certainly, we don't want evil to overtake these people, but this country being on their back foot and having to watch out for their, their distant colonies is better for us. So an armed band of adventurers going in and taking out the caves of chaos doesn't serve us very well. That so little things like that, if you consider the broader repercussions of what characters are going to do, even just the location of towns that the characters may visit and rumors that may get out, your campaign world will grow if you consider that. Even the individual actions of characters can can have repercussions. If you're if you're really watching how things how how things play out, maybe um, maybe you're playing in the world of Greyhawk and Nobody in your party is particularly fond of Foltus. Well, that's fine. There's lots of deities in Greyhawk, right? Well, there's a kingdom in Greyhawk, the Theocracy of the Pale, that is pretty religiously intolerant, and they're all Foltus worshippers. So have your have your characters just created an international incident by telling the the <laughs> proselytizing priest of Foltus to shut his trap and leave them alone? It's lit. It's little details like that whereby you can build your uh your campaign world um and watch what your characters do sometimes mm -hmm. pay very close attention to what your characters are doing or saying sometimes this the least significant thing they do can fill your head with great ideas yeah so one thing i've noticed with especially recently uh, with sort of the rise of D and D streams, uh, where you watch people play games, it seems like characters are, or I shouldn't say characters, where players are really into writing huge, huge backstories for their characters. You know, very elaborate things. So, for someone making a campaign, um, how much do you do you think you should put in? of characters backstories uh with your campaign is it more like as little as possible or do you think that you should work with them if i feel like it can suit my campaign um then i may take something you put down on your character sheet and run with it one of the coolest things about the hero system game rules is you can create uh you can basically get build points. Uh, Hero System is a is a point buy game where your stats and your powers are increased with character build points. Um, and one way to get extras is to essentially you get extra points by giving yourself negative attributes. Uh, it's mm -hmm. called disadvantages. You can, you can take a disadvantage in something. Well, one of the disadvantages in hero system is, uh, is dependent NPC. That is uh, Spider-Man's grandma or uh, Spider-Man's Aunt May rather. Whoops. Uh, I just 
just a trip on my comic knowledge there. Spider-Man's Aunt May, you know, she's not super powered. She can't fend for herself. If Galactus decides to, to uh, punt Spider-Man up between the, the uprights of the, uh, the um, 59th street bridge and he's not home and Aunt May is, you know, that's, uh Oh, well, I've got to go save my dependent NPC, Aunt May. Um, little hooks like that can help drive a story. You're like, okay, well, I'm running a Marvel-based game set in the heroes, uh, using the hero system uh, rules. Uh, gosh, who's got a you know who's got a dependent NPC that I can that I can write into the uh, write into the story and and make them uh, make them a foil, you know, for characters. Is mm -hmm. it uh, is it Mary Jane, Spider Man's girlfriend? Is it Aunt May? Is it uh, you know is it just this person or that person? Um, as far as huge backstories um i mean i can take them or leave them i i don't want players to be overburdened with once upon a time um you know i'm a firm believer that the that a backstory should be uh a backstory should be um what your players do with their characters once the campaign is started. I, I don't mind if somebody says, you know, yeah, my character is human, but I was raised by dwarves. I was an orphan and, you know, I was given over to dwarves. Mm -hmm. um, that can be kind of an interesting hook. I just, it, it comes down to individual DM preferences, but I think if you want an extensive backstory, ask the DM first or DM, ask your players first. Say, do you guys want to have like rich story backgrounds? Some players might. They might just say, no, man, I'm Bob the fighter. I wear I wear plate <laughs> yeah. mail. I have, I have a long sword. I have a backpack with 10 iron spikes, four torches, two flasks of oil, 50 feet of rope, and a week's worth of iron rations. Let's go. You know, and that, and that's that's it. That mm -hmm. that's what that's what the person in in question wants to do. I mean, um, you know, everybody knows the named character from Dungeons and Dragons, Melf. Well, yeah. Mel Melf has his name because Luke Gygax rolled up the character after the one prior to him had died ignominiously, and his dad said, "Well, what are you running? I'm running an elf." Okay, is it male? Yeah, male elf. M dot elf. And that's all he put on his character sheet uh, above his stats. Mail out. So there, you know the story of the creation of Melf. Um, so I think it can vary as far as DMs cribbing ideas from their characters who have extensive backstories. Absolutely. If your players are going to give you that ammunition, then take it. I said at the beginning of a conversation, crib ideas from everywhere. You are doing yourself a disservice as a DM if you do not pick up every single potential idea and at least examine it. And if your players come with, you know, three typewritten sheets stapled to the back of their character sheet, you as the DM, uh, your players may have just done all the work you need. Hmm. You know, and it can be a bit of a thrill for the players because then it's like, oh my God, you mean I... I really am the, the nephew of the King of Lendor. Yes. A, as was written in the prophecy <laughs> and that, and, and that can shape your world a little. If you don't like where characters are going, just remember it is your campaign, regardless of the rule system to be mastered by you, the DM, mm. the storyteller, the, the referee, whatever it's your campaign world. So how do you, um, just as a DM in a campaign, how do you sort of find that balance? Uh, you know, because I think in general, most players are very happy to sort of go along. There, there's like an implicit contract that, hey, we're going to run this kind of campaign. Okay. And they sort of go along with that. Uh, how do you sort of nip it in the bud if a character, or not character, if a player, um, you know, ha wants like the spotlight more and more or 
more of their own storyline or backstory carved out into it. Um, you know, that stuff can be fun uh, to put in, but ultimately you have to have the main thrust of whatever your story arc is continuing, but the campaign just sort of devolves. Right. I think in a campaign, if you've got someone who's people who are enthusiastic about what their character is and can do, um, most of them fall into a category of ultimately being reasonable people who you can say, you know, Hey, let's, let's make sure we're giving everybody a chance to, to, to role play or, um, you know, the princess of Tamaril appreciates your enthusiasm, but she doesn't have, you know, she doesn't have the means to equip you to go on a quest for your lost father. Instead, she asks, could you please go clear out the orcs lair? Like she, she originally summoned you here to do. Um, and, and I think most reasonable people will, will understand that that's not the case now unfortunately uh like anywhere in life gaming has its percentage of unreasonable well uh, before we go straight to the 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 extremely negative the gray area people who you know they might get a little insistent you can take it offline with them and have a conversation say ah hey man yeah no look i i get it i appreciate it uh let's you know that may be an avenue we're going to explore later you know, you give them a wink, give them a little attaboy. It's like, I yeah, I know you want, I know you want to, but you know, we're gonna run, you know, we're we're gonna run uh, uh, White Plume Mountain right now, and let's see how things are when you come out of that. Let let's let's see how you're feeling about, you know, searching for this thing that you've got written in your character backstory, um, and then if you get somebody who's just insistent and they dig in their heels and they're going to wreck your game or, you know, potentially insist on doing stuff. That's, that's going to fall outside the scope of your campaign. Well, then we're, we're traipsing into the realm of DMing horror stories and you just, you gotta, you know, <laughs> you, you gotta remember it's it, regardless of what system it is. Um, Traveler, Star Wars, Robotech, uh, battle tech, um, you know, middle earth role-playing dungeons and dragons, there's going to be those people. And you just, you, you know, you've got to put your foot down and say, look, this is the way my campaign world works. This is the way my campaign world is ordered. I know you put some interesting stuff in your character sheet. I told you I'd try to address it as I can. You know, I, I, I hate to ever use the term firing people from your game. I want everyone to have fun. I want everybody to have a good time. But, you know, if you've got a way that your campaign's going and everybody else is happy with it and nobody wants to get derailed, nobody wants to get sidetracked from how your game is going, then maybe it's best if they find another game. Yeah, to me, the, the whole point of this hobby is to have fun. Yes. And, you know, if... You can look at it one of two ways. Uh, either they're ruining your fun, they're harsh and you're mellow, or really you could think of it as, well, if they need all this other stuff, they're clearly not having fun in your campaign, which is okay because not everybody has to like everything you do. Um, but you can tell them like, hey, man, you know, I see you're not having fun. Why? Maybe you should look into somewhere else. Uh, it's In a lot of ways, it's do, as long as you're not a jerk about it, it's doing them a favor. Because why should they waste their free time on something they don't like? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, exactly. I mean, if you're not having fun at my campaign and you know, you know, that I know you said you were the chosen one that would slay the, uh, the Admantium dragon in the final battle to defend the, uh, the kingdom of, of good kind that just, that just ain't in my game. That uh, That's something you're, character had a dream about but it's it's not my campaign and if they're gonna throw a fit don't let them derail your game so um so getting back to the uh defeating all dragon kind uh 
when you're when you're making your story arc, do you think you should start off with an overall uh, end bad guy in mind? Like, yeah, this ends up with Orcus or Tiamat. Definitely Tiamat. Or do you think you should just do smaller arcs that then sort of build up and you you can fudge around and sort of make it seem like you had that idea in the beginning? I don't I don't feel I, I okay I think if you're gonna have a living campaign world I think you rob yourself of a great deal of creativity if you say there's a Sauron there's an Orcus there's uh uh what's his name the undead king in, in game of thrones if you if you if your linchpin is that event and you're like all events lead up to this and nowhere else i feel like you handicap yourself because you'll paint yourself creatively into a corner because mm -hmm. if your party finds a well of many worlds and uses it and has a six month like six in real life months so you know four times a month you know 24 gaming sessions uh spent having an absolute ball and they never want that to end you know mm -hmm. you, if you've if you've uh sauroned yourself you if you've sauroned your campaign world you've created a situation where you know you're going to have to pop their balloon, which I, I realize that may seem to run exactly opposite to what I just said of you have an ordered campaign world. Don't let the players dictate exactly mm -hmm. how that'll go. But at the same time, now, if you set a timetable, if the characters are like, yeah, okay, uh, we got to go slay Orcus. You know, he's taken up residence on the prime material plane in this kingdom but first we're going to go through this well of many worlds and party down with with uh with jins and jans and afreed and everything um you know if they come back and it's you know it's the, the, literally the campaign world has been pulled into the abyss they got nobody to blame but themselves um <laughs> But I, yeah. I think in the overall, setting up one ultimate end to it at the outset. Let me let me clarify at the outset. If you're driving along a campaign and you're like, okay, there's going to be a point. A point's coming. Dan wants to run a game, but he knows I want to finish this game up. The characters are all ultra high level, blah, blah, blah. And you want to then craft an ultimate adventure, go for it. But I, I just don't think from the outset, because then you, you, Yang, you run into an issue of scripted events mm -hmm. that players might not want to enjoy being on the railroad for. So, you know, that's an interesting question too. I mean, I've, I've always kind of looked at these stories in two ways. Like you can have two kinds. One is, sort of a, a chosen one where you're fated to I don't know, save the world or something. And you can have a lot of varied um, adventures on that path. Uh, it doesn't have to be so linear or you could be, you could have characters reacting to things in the world, like things that are larger than themselves. So a, a zombie invasion and they have to, you know, save the town or, get the heck out of the town or something like that. Um, how, when you're talking about railroading, um, it seems like you need some sort of structure, even though I, I definitely agree it needs to be a bit malleable. Like, I guess how, how stiff of a structure, you know, is it, uh, are we talking about rebar or are we talking about like, 
balsa wood or, you know, what, what's the, you need a little something to hang your stories on, but how, I don't know. What's my mind is going blank on how to phrase. No, how, I, I, I understand how inflexible should you be with the adventures and so on you have planned in your campaign. Um, mm -hmm. I think once your once your characters have put the adventure in gear, mm -hmm. you should treat it like you know you go out and you press down on the clutch and you put the car in gear and you're cruising down the highway and you think what would happen if without even stepping on the clutch I just grabbed the stick and slammed it into reverse that that should pretty much tell you how flexible you need to be as far as as far as that goes you know it's going to break it, it, you know things are going to break and that doesn't necessarily mean that you know your campaign is going to be ruined mm -hmm. i'm just unlike your transmission in that example um <laughs> i'm just saying that a lot of stuff is going to fly off the rails and sure. if you don't have that built in flexibility then you need to make sure that the characters, if they touch the stick shift, they understand that, that they're going to break things. One of the one of the coolest things uh, in video games was um, in uh, Morrowind. Most people think it's the first Elder okay. Scrolls game. It's the third, um, but you could kill anyone in Morrowind, including main quest givers. I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think the only person you couldn't kill before it was a, the appropriate time to was Dagother, the bad, the, the chief bad guy in Morrowind. Um, and even killing him doesn't end the game. You still got tons of content and you can make your own fun. But um, when you would kill an important NPC, you would get a message on screen that says, the threads of prophecy have been broken. With the death of this character... It ends, you know, it, 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 it ends the, uh, the possibility for, for the game to go on. But I don't remember what it says. The fans of Morrowind will know what I'm talking about. You know, you go and beat Caius Casatis to death or whatever. Um, and it basically, it broke the main quest of the game and it would tell you so, but let you continue on and just say, you know, you can reload a save game or you may continue to adventure in this doomed world that you've created. Um, you know, if your characters do that and that's the way you want to handle it, no, no do-overs, then, then by all means. But I think it, it is, it is poor DMing and it puts up a huge railroad crossing sign with the red flashing lights and the arm that drops down and everything. If, you know, if the characters are like, Look, I'm sick of this two-bit, second-rate Gandalf ripoff coming <laughs> over here and giving yeah. us a bunch of guff. This uh, Elminster guy, I'm going to just draw my sword and stab him. And your characters have the means to do it. And you deus ex machina him out of the way to preserve your story. I think that's too rigid. So, you know, if there's things that they do that upset your your game and they're prepared to live with the consequence, then so be it. I know that's kind of a roundabout way of answering your question about how flexible or inflexible should it be, but no, that makes sense. That's the best I got, man. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's yeah. I mean, I, I always think that there's kind of a delicate balance because, um, you know, you set out to tell a certain story in a certain game. And if, you know, I, I guess it's really, you have to figure out what this group of, players you know in particular really uh what really catches their interest you know because if they're not that interested in in how you had it planned that is exactly what's going to happen um but uh but yeah i think at the same time if they really don't have any agency and they don't their their choices aren't meaningful then um then yeah i, I think that's where you get the player revolt. 
Yeah, and I think you you hit on exactly the right word, agency. Regardless of what your campaign is like, kids, make sure your players have agency in it. You know, Dragonlance is a railroad ain't a meme just because. <laughs> you know, this is a, a yes. like I I can mine anything for maps and and ideas. But I remember leafing through uh, a Dragonlance module and it's saying in black and white, the players and these NPCs have to be alive. If they're not, you know, at the end, make sure that by some means they come back alive so that the, the story will, and I'm like, why didn't you just stick to, to, publishing novels guys yeah honestly this is an adventure Th this this is an adventure about like uh going through pirates of the caribbean is a uh is is a boat trip through dangerous waters it, it's it basically the dragon lance modules are you know disney rides there yeah, yeah, there's yeah. and and i'm sorry but the campaign is too there, there is just very little player agency given in those campaigns. So that's something that I would insist that you absolutely positively do give your players in your campaign world, player agency up to a point. If they are the ones who are building a railroad for you, the dungeon master, then yeah, you have to step in and you have to say, look, we're not going that way. You know, I appreciate mm -hmm. that you did your little creative writing thing because the players can produce just as inflexible of a railroad as bad modules can for you, the dungeon master. Don't let yourself be railroaded by modules in your own campaign world. And don't let yourself be railroaded by players in your own campaign world. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so we have a question from just a passerby. Uh, just for the stubborn player who wants to go left while well, they got to go right, would you ever say, okay, let's wait two weeks and I'll have that part of the map developed or go left? Um, it, so, depends. Uh, it, 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 it depends. I mean, if, if we're talking about, um, if we're talking about a dungeon and I literally don't have that spot mapped out, I'll just, I'll make sure that there is no right, um, there, there is no, and if they come back later and I do have it mapped out and there's a right hand passage, it's magic. I ain't got to explain shit. Um, if we're talking about a, a campaign world, um, I will do my best to, to go on. Now, fortunately in this day and age, um, and I say in this day and age, as I'm about to reference 40 year old pieces of software, but bear with me, um, in this day and age, there are, um, uh, applications that you can run admittedly through DOS box for dungeons and dragons to create encounters on the fly right then. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, if you want to throw in something, you know, because the players have decided not to go into the gray mountains, but instead into the green marsh and you don't have the green marsh mapped out yet. I mean, it's not difficult to say, you know, you know, scummy water up to your knees, mosquitoes getting in the joints of your armor, sweat pouring down your faces, never a dry place to sit on. And, you know, the, the mucky rise in the ground with like a black hole in the middle of it, uh, eight lizard men leap up out of the hole, roll for surprise, and then let's roll for initiative. Um, it's, and, and if you need the stats for lizard men, you've got applications these days on hand to do it. It's not difficult to give them the right hand turn if they want the right hand turn. Um, but I would never just, in an outdoor area, I would never just say, okay, uh, sorry, we're just going to stop the game here tonight because I, I don't have it mapped. Hmm. 
I, I would throw sense. I would throw something at the players. Um, uh, yeah, it kind of reminds me of a, a story. I had this professor one time. He was talking about when he started teaching. He started teaching photography classes. Uh, he he was a photographer in the Navy, but he didn't know a lot of the, the technical stuff. So he said, uh, you know, he took the job. He just said he could do it, even though he really couldn't. And all he said was, you know, all that mattered is that I was one chapter ahead of all the students and everything was fine. And I think uh, in a lot of ways, DMing is kind of like that too. You don't need to have the the whole thing planned out. Like you can on the fly make up entering the marsh. And like you said, uh, plenty of marsh creatures there. And, um, you know, you can just quickly flip through for some random encounter tables and uh, just get them to a part. Okay, you're in the marsh. And, you know, if you need to end it, I think most people are more satisfied with calling it a little bit early that week than going through something that just seems like it's added there just to take time. Yeah, I definitely think there's truth to that. I I, I think there's a, you know, most people are grownups. Most people understand that their DMs may hit a point where just like the players, I mean, and I've seen this with new players, especially who might, regardless of what game, what edition, I'm not, you know, it can be mm -hmm. something as old and hoary as, as uh, OD and D, or it can be something brand new, like, um, you know, the new uh, alien role-playing game from Free League and everything in between where you tell a player, okay, Yank, what are you doing? And, you know, you just get deer in the headlights. Uh, I don't know. Okay. All right. You're hanging back. You know, you're, you know, it's a tense situation. So you're, you're just gonna, you know, wait. And then maybe that's, that's on repeat all night. Um, or, you know, it's a minimal thing that you do, but, you know, I as a I as a GM would understand like yeah yeah you you know maybe you're a new gamer maybe you're new to this system you just don't know what you know what or how to to interact with the future, um, and so you just kind of feel things out. And I would no more demand that a character give me an immediate action th than I would think that players likewise would would you know there'd be a collective disappointed sigh if you know the green marshes i just described them as you know endless mud flats and mangroves and ponds and that sort of thing and you know it wasn't full of of excite of exciting exotic danger mm, yeah that's a good point so all right so now people they have their Starting point, they've got their initial map. They've flipped through some uh, got, um, not got some modules. They've taken what they think they need. They've got very loose story outline for the start. Um, so one of the, the questions that I see a lot, especially in this day and age, how do you go about finding your players? Um, pester your friends. It, it, I mean, we, we're all here, you know, we, we're all of us here are because or, you know, online or we know each other through social media, but we're here because we know our collective butts from a hole in the ground. Um, D&D role playing games, I keep saying role playing games in general are kind of, you know, part and parcel they're, they're a coin of the realm for us finding gamers shouldn't shouldn't be difficult most people will quote unquote get it when you start talking about role playing games i mean i yeah I, i've i've watched youtubers who have probably never touched a die you know, they, they know what a 20 sided die is. They've seen freaks and geeks. They've seen community and maybe caught some, some critical role or something like that. It's fake D and D people anyway. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Was that my outside voice when I said that? <laughs> sorry. Gosh, I thought that 
Ooh, that inner monologue thing is going to get me in trouble one day. But um, they, uh, they, um, they get it somehow, right? So, mm -hmm. so saying to somebody, "Hey, have you, you know, have you ever tried a role playing game?" It's it's not the, it's not that big of a hurdle to at least get a few people to sit down. Um, it can be a little intimidating. Particularly, you know, if, if you're exposing your creativity to people, uh, oh, that's <laughs> are we still doing phrasings? Um, but if you if you're if you're showing people your campaign world, if you're showing them, um, there is a uh, you know, th there's there's a whole world of gaming that I want to show you that isn't you know. Uh, I'm about to date myself. You can all make the okay boomer jokes. I mean, it isn't Candy Crush. It isn't World of Warcraft, but it's, you know, it's something deeper. Mm -hmm. Most people kind of get it. And it's just, it's just a matter of biting the bullet and sitting down. If you're not comfortable initially going out and getting a group and getting them into your campaign, play a one shot. There's plenty of one shot yeah. adventures. You know, you can just, you can come up with a ruin that's 10 rooms, roll out a wet erase battle mat or dry erase battle mat, rather. Don't use wet erase markers on them. Um, or is it don't use dry erase? I, ca I can't remember chess X people. I think wet. I think you're not supposed to use wet. All right. Anyway. Um, but regardless of what you do and, and how you play it, um, you know, just, just throw it out there. Look, I have a game that's been going on for seven years now. It's all set in this. It's all in the world of Greyhawk, but it's been two separate campaigns. And group B has heard of a few of the exploits of group A, but all the people in group B or mo many of the people in group B were in group A as different characters. Um, and I just... You know, I, I just started asking people. Uh, I had a, a wonderful guest, a, a lovely woman uh, on my live stream on Wednesday, uh, Aurora Williams. She's been in my campaign since um, 2014. And I just asked, I just said, hey, do you want to play D&D? &D? And, that, and that, that was that was literally it. You know, if there if there's a group of geek friends you have that are willing to give it a try, start there. You don't have to like, you know, walk up to the creepy 380 pound cat piss man in the gore guts t shirt in the comic <laughs> shop who who just gets uh, porno comics in his subscription box and How ask do you him know who works in my comic shop. <laughs> because he's everywhere he's he's a phenotype um you may not like it but this is what pete creeper looks like um but you know we all have circles of geek friends and if you're not a nerd from the get-go you just saw D D and thought it might look like fun you don't have to subject yourself i ask your other non-nerd friends you know, I, I mean, you would be surprised at the number of people who laugh and snort and, you know, do the ogre from Revenge of the Nerds yell <laughs> at people that play D&D &D and so on. Um, the number of people that will sit down and have fun playing a role playing game with you. I mean, there's a somebody linked a video um, over on uh, uh, my Discord channel about a guy who ran a play test of D20 Star Wars when it first came out at Planet Hollywood in Los Angeles when Planet Hollywood was still a thing. Um, and a British man and his wife had come to the United States to go on a vacation tour and they went to Los Angeles because they wanted to see Hollywood. And the one night that their tour guide had booked them to see to go dine at planet hollywood that was their meal ticket it was closed because wizards of the coast had rented the place out 
to debut the Star Wars D20 role-playing game. And I don't remember what the specifics were. Uh, I, I think basically at the door they said, you know, if you're registered for the event, you can come in. And this is an elderly British couple. How do we register? And a sign-up sheet. They signed up the sheet. They came in, ate their meal, looked around, were armpit deep in American nerds in their 20s and 30s, probably some younger, and walked over to the guy demoing the game and asked him what it was. And he explained Star Wars to them. Now, I, there's a little bit of, and that man's name was Albert Einstein about the story, <laughs> yeah. but, but it is very cute. I mean, I don't believe that the guy didn't know what Star Wars was. But with this elderly British couple, so the story goes, they played Star D20 Star Wars and had an absolute blast playing it. All right. <laughs> you know, so there, there's a couple of people who um, loved playing Star Wars and not role-playing gamers at all. Uh, now, did that, did that mean that those people like went and started a campaign? Maybe not. But the thing about it is, is you can go to events, you can run games at events, you know, just mm -hmm. print up, print up a little contact sheet to say, Hey, uh, you know, if you, if you had fun playing this, if you had fun playing tales from the loop, I do kind of a weekly thing. And if you're nervous about doing that, like you don't want to invite strangers into your home, do it at the store, right. ask, ask the store owner. I guess that that would probably be a good follow on statement, which would be venue. If you're doing a months or weeks long, I guess I did that backwards, a weeks or months long campaign game. Um, you know, you can do it in a neutral site. You can do it in a yeah. neutral site as long as you want. You may find as time goes on that the people that you game with stop being gamers and turn into your friends. I'm not saying it's going to happen. Yeah, you know, it, that's that's exactly my story. Um, so I, I was out of gaming for quite a long time, and I got back into it in 2017. And we found each other on Reddit, of all places. And I think all of us were kind of like, okay, these are people from Reddit, so I have to hide my wallet and, um, you know, make sure nobody gets behind me. Uh, but we met at a right. game store and we played at game stores for uh, probably the first year and a half to two years. And then we started going over to somebody's house so we could drink, uh, as you probably should during D&D. &D. Yes. Um, and, and uh, you know, and it's from there. And we actually just finished, you know, an almost four year campaign um, just earlier this year. And it's been fantastic. And now they're all playing in uh, my campaign. So I definitely agree with you on that. It's definitely yeah. worth, uh, you know, sort of putting yourself out there and giving it a go. And I do think that the majority of people who would want to play um, are good. You know, it's like everybody everywhere in any country. The vast majority of people are fairly good natured. Um, they're there to have fun. They could be, you know, watching Netflix or playing uh, video games or, you know, doing whatever. But they go because they want to play. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, w without a doubt. And there, there should never be, you know, there should never be a question of, oh man, what, what if, you know, what if people say no? I mean, my Monday night campaign and I'm, you know, I, I constantly tell people, yeah, I got 13 people in that game and they're like, wow. That's amazing. How did you get that many people? The answer is very slowly. It was not a, you know, it was not an instant. Uh, it, it, it was, it was not an instant process. It was not, it was not an immediate thing where people just, just leaped onto it and said, um, Oh, wow. We have to, you know, we, we all have to get into Bill Silly's game. Um, I just, over time, I would just ask people, I mean, 
one of my players who who plays an actual ad and bard and those of you who know your ad and rules know that that's not an easy feat it's not like later editions and even uh some editions of DD that had uh or some editions of first first edition ad and some options for first edition ad and that had the option for you to start as a bard you know that the the textbook ad and bard is not an easy thing to get that guy running that bard said yeah i'll play for a few weeks until the 5e campaign that i'm going to play in starts and here we are <laughs> you know <laughs> hey here, here, here we are um so it just it's just a matter of sticking to it it's just it's just a matter of 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 playing um you know play play the numbers ask ask people that that you think are a good match mm -hmm. um so you know just uh just, so uh, so I've got a, a controversial question uh, that I'm going to bring up here. Oh, come on. And... I'm the most laid back guy on YouTube. Controversial <laughs> questions are my meat and drink. I'm going to, I'm going to answer this in the calm, cool, collected style that I always do. <laughs> Hit me. So we have the RPG consent checklist. Now this is something that was making the rounds earlier in the year. Um, and it was panned pretty heavily. I, however, am going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to say it's actually not that bad. Now, I think that uh, we have to make a few changes to this. First of all, it should never be called consent. Uh, that is just creepy on its face. Um, and second of all, the players should never be able to dictate what kind of a game you run or what content you have. However, I think something like this can work well, uh, especially in a situation where, like you're saying, if you don't have friends and you want to pick up uh, players like at a store or online, this can be helpful if you sort of give them a preview, give them a flavor of what you're going to have in the game. So, you know, if we look at this, for example, uh, horror, uh, spiders. Are you okay with spiders? Well, if someone has a severe spider phobia uh, and they want nothing to do with it and you're running a module where you have to go into the spider temple, that's not going to be a good match. Um, so like when I look for players, I generally tell them uh, it's going to be like a 1980s R-rated movie. So if you're not comfortable with that level of violence that they had in those movies or um, adult content, um, or if you want more violence or more adult content, I'm not up for that. Uh, so what do you think in terms of, um, I hate to say safety warning, but like a content warning? I mean, first of all, There, there's there's two levels we're talking about here. Look, mm -hmm. with a 12 person. Sorry, I had to answer a question in text there. With a 12 person campaign, it has come up that there's a, some romance going on in my game. And I was jo I, I joke a little bit with uh, one of my players about it. I said, you people turned my gritty... Fritz Labor, Fofford and Grey Mouser, uh, grungy street battle AD and D game into romantic fantasy novel, <laughs> which, which the the joke is very meta and and double nested because Fofford and Grey Mouser had many romantic uh, encounters with many women over their careers, um, and and it Fl Fritz Labor uh, wrote about them, but uh, um. I'm very much a fade to black kind of guy. Like, you know, yeah. you take the bucks of made to your, to your room at the end and then fade to black, you know, 
Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't really have any use for having pretend sex on graph paper. <laughs> yes. In any capacity, in any capacity, I don't feel like, um, you know, uh, you know, you, the, the village has been attacked by orcs, uh, you know, and it was, it, it was savage. You know, mm -hmm. there, there, there are a few survivors, you know, some, some women folk and, and, you know, a few men that were left for dead and it, and it was savage. I don't really have to give you a rundown on exactly what happened. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so my games are, you, you talk about eighties R rated movies. My games, hew pretty close to Conan the barbarian. Okay. Um, maybe even less so because, you know, uh, there's a scene where Conan boned the witch there before he rescued Subatai. Uh, and you know, I, I would not launch into a description of that scene. If that was a play, uh, the witch takes you into her hut, fade to black, <laughs> you know, next um, morning. So the next, the next morning after you've thrown her into the fire, um, <laughs> no, the, uh, so it does that aspect doesn't come up, hmm. but look, this is a game ultimately of blood and violence. Mm -hmm. Dungeons and Dragons does not mean that there's not going to be blood and violence. Um, you know, there's there's blood and violence in some of the the quaintest fantasy literature from like the turn of the century the king of elfland's daughter has people getting hacked apart uh, go read beowulf you know oh, yeah. beowulf ripping uh what's what's her name's uh, uh or um uh the not the wendigo shit you know, uh, uh, ripping people uh, apart with his own hands. You, you know, it's like blood everywhere. Um, I'm not. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to say, "Oh, I'm sorry, you're squeamish when I said the word beheaded." It's 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 D and D. It, it I'm 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 sorry. It it happens. Um, as far as and as far as spiders and. And that sort of thing, it just, mm -hmm. it, it just, it comes up. It just, it does. It's a fantasy game. There's fantasy monsters. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, you know, my sign up sheet has room for your name and your email address. Yeah. And, and I, I, I'm not really going to start cutting and trick. So let's say I put out the trigger warning sheet for all 12 mm -hmm. of my players. And I, and I and I lived and died by it. One of my players thinks orcs are an ugly racial stereotype. No orcs. Mm -hmm. One of my players thinks that, um, I don't know, one of my players is disgusted and freaked out by eyes. No beholders. One of my players has that made-up thing about holes. Okay, no pit traps, no portable holes, no bags of holding. And I go through... Just down the list, you know, one person is extremely uh, turned off by class inequality. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, there goes the entire pseudo medieval setting. All right, so we throw that out. So what am I left with? You, if, I, if I go down the list and you think of potential, even reasonable things that people could could veto if 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 I was given to listening to that. And I threw out one thing for each for each of the people. You have nothing left. I'd have nothing left. I'd say you're walking across a field. Oh crap! Tracy's agoraphobic, and Shelby's and and, and Shelby's um, uh, claustrophobic. So you're walking across an endless medium sized room. See, that's when I uh, that's when I start to lean into things. But I'm more of a lawful evil DM. Um, so, you know, I agree with everything you say, uh, which is why I believe that the players should not be able to veto, um, what's 
what the content is with the DM. But do you think uh, there's any place to not trigger one, but it's like, hey, it's going to be like this, you know, where you you well, like you said, like think of the movie Conan the Barbarian. And if you had problems with that movie, you know, it's something that uh, people would know like, oh, okay, that's not for me. Uh, Because I I did see on Twitter just a few weeks ago, there was a woman who wrote, um, how come D&D always has to have violent encounters? Like, isn't anyone running a campaign without violence? Uh, And it's like, no, you're probably looking for another game like, you know, Scrabble or something. Um, But do you think there's, you should sort of, I guess, advertise that like, yeah, I'm not changing any of these things uh, ahead of time when you're picking up random new players. So, like, obviously, if it's your friends, you should be able to, you know, gauge the temperature of the room with them. Um, but uh, do, do you think that there's any place for, I hate to say trigger warnings, but uh, we're going to be doing these things. If you're cool with that, you're welcome to play. If not, maybe another table's for you. I think it's it it is entirely um I think it's on the GM to gauge the players uh, what kind of player you've got at your table. Like, you know, I, I, I just referenced Fofford and Gray Mauser, right? And they mm-hmm. got up to some shenanigans, some some uh stuff that would be better faded to black to if it was at a gaming table as as uh as um fritz leiber wrote those stories uh, you know the tales of fofford and mauser um in the city interesting pieces of trivia just if i may interject um sure the fofford and gray mauser stories were actual stories that fritz leiber would write after they happened um, and what I mean by that is he and Harry Otto Fisher would go out carousing around Los Angeles. Uh, this was in the late 1940s, just getting mm-hmm. roaring drunk and getting into fist fights and, and, you know, just blind set. And he would come home and write, uh, uh, Fritz Leiber would sit down and, and, and write fantasy stories based on his and Harry Otto Fisher's, uh, uh, shenanigans they would get up to. And kind of use those as outlines for the characters of Fofford and Mouser in uh, Lankmar. Um, <laughs> and the the other, and this is a, a very serious uh, fade to black thing, um, is Fritz was close friends of Gary's. And Fritz also had a crush on Mary Gygax, Gary's Ooh. wife at the time. Um and one during one visit, he brought Mary a uh, uh, the pirates the pirate queen sculpture, and it was a little study in a six inch bronze figurine of Mary Gygax as the titular pirate queen, wearing nothing but a starfish on her nethers. <laughs> Ouch! That's so, got to be awkward. Uh, I, I guess, you know, I, I told that story, I told that story to, uh, to Ishii and he said, I would have punched him in his damn face. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, It's uh, amazing how this story does not end in a hospital visit for someone. It's indeed. Well, Gary and Mary were very much on the outs. She might've, she might've been, you know, just, Uh Oh, you know, well, ha ha. At least somebody appreciates me, you know, kind of thing. I don't know. I don't know the particulars of the family dynamic at that point, but I know that it is on her mantelpiece to this day. So, jeez. So, um, anyway, uh, but to get to get back to uh, Fofford and Mouser and fade to black moments, um, I think you're going to know what kind of player you're dealing with. I and. You know, there, there's a couple of, well, I, I can think of one very infamous high profile case that propped, that, that, that cropped up where 
I don't know, some DM who was going for like a critical role kind of thing, and he was a game designer, uh, did some creeper thing in his game where like one of the characters was a robot and another an npc that the dm was running like put a usb drive in them that was basically like a an orgasm program program Ooh, and then the person okay. running the person running the robot was like yeah that's sexual assault <laughs> you know he sexually assaulted Jeez. me in the game um i'm not gonna i'm not gonna take a side on this uh, on this matter but you know my advice to anyone for your campaign is dms don't don't be a fucking creeper if you're not if you're not a fucking creeper you're, you're not gonna have to worry about an x card and if you're like, oh but i want to have sex in my games then then and i hate to say this feel your audience out and don't you know, don't be shocked when you have people who are revolted by, by, by what you do. But if you don't, if you don't act like a fucking creeper, you're not going to have situations where you need X cards. And I don't mean you have mm -hmm. to neuter your game. I don't mean you have to come in and you have to make your game, you know, this, uh, start shirt and tie and short pants Sunday school affair. I mean, don't be a creeper and you should damn well know what i mean when i say don't be a creeper you know ad and d dms you don't have to not have loth being a pervy bitch but you also don't have to launch into a description of her labia and and the size cup she wears and that sort of thing to get that across it's it's not necessary now if you've got a crowd if that's your thing and your gaming group digs on that, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. But if you bring a stranger in and you didn't tell them that, and suddenly you're getting dragged on Twitter, well, but I, I think people are smart enough to know that they don't, that, to, to not be a creeper or to avoid the DM who is a creeper or to not invite people into your game if you are a creeper. But you're, <laughs> A conscientious creeper who doesn't want to actually upset people you've got your pervy yes. little gaming yes. group and you're all perverts together and bravo but you don't want to get the you don't want to freak the normies that's not something that you enjoy then you don't need x cards in your campaign you don't need uh, a, a a punch list of you may do this in your campaign and you may not do that in your campaign uh, so, question from Volcano God. Any idea what year this Libra thing happened? I'm sorry. Any idea what year? Oh, the the Fritz Light. No, I don't. I don't know. I I do know that in this. Uh, um, so Fritz Leiber wrote some stuff for Dragon Magazine, the Dragon, as it was called, and I'm talking probably when it was um, like single or at most double digit issues uh mm. and gary and fritz uh were friends um the uh the um uh so i can only surmise it would have been sometime from the at the at the the earliest the late 60s into the mid late 70s 76 77 maybe um if if i yeah, ju just 70s, did a guess the 70s were a very interesting time uh for anyone who's young enough to not have lived through it not uh hear stories about it from people uh there's just a whole lot of things you have to shake your head at and go what was wrong with you people? Yeah. I mean, Liber was born in 1910. So mm -hmm. he he would have been pushing 60 at that time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's that's straying into harmless old coot territory. 
<laughs> not uh, my God, this lech wants to drag my wife into, uh, uh, you know, in, into bed with him. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, uh, so we've covered a lot of ground tonight. Uh, any other tips for uh, starting campaigns? Um, don't be afraid to use prepackaged campaigns and don't mm -hmm. be afraid to beat them up. <laughs> don't be afraid to alter them. You might love Darlene's Greyhawk map and hate Gary's Greyhawk writings. Then take the map and use the map for something else. You might, you know, you might hate the map for, uh, for, um, Forgotten Realms, but love the Greyhawk map. Boom, there you go. Um, there are too many resources available these days at your fingertips. Like I just said, Fritz Library was born in 1910. I looked it up on the interwebs. You know, I didn't just have that knocking around on top, uh, on uh, on the dome. Um, but. There's too many good resources. Don't limit yourself. Don't don't feel like you are beholden to one thing or the other. If you want to do a glorious mashup where there's a super earth and one continent is Greyhawk and one continent is Forgotten Realms and one continent is Dragonlance, then do it. If you want to just start out with a giant sheet of X paper and put a little dot in the middle and say the players start here and start filling in stuff. You can do that too. There's too much cool stuff and too many good resources available at your fingertips to deny yourself a good campaign. And one thing I, we didn't get to, and I, I just, I want to mm -hmm. touch on this real quick. Oh yeah. Campaign can have many meetings. Don't be intimidated when I talk about building a world and, drawing a map the first campaign was just people going into the dungeon of castle greyhawk the first the first D, D campaign gary ran it was just people going into the dungeon and he didn't give a huge amount of concern to the larger world until a little bit later and then he used the hex map that came with the game outdoor survival by avalon hill and in mm -hmm. fact original D, D says you need these three booklets a pair of six-sided dice, pencil, paper, the game Chainmail to handle combat, and the game Outdoor Survival if you want an outdoor campaign map. So a campaign can be a series of, of dungeon adventures that culminates in the killing of the boss down on level nine. It can be a world or worlds or plane or planes hopping adventure that spans years it's up to you go out there and find the things that you like in other settings and and roll with it i mean i was a little intimidated uh when when i first started running twilight 2000 because i looked at google maps for those of you who aren't familiar with central europe Central Europe is dense. There's like a town every couple of kilometers. Like it, it's it's pretty much like a continent-wide American suburb in, in, ter in terms of population density. And when I was thinking, man, okay, there's some major cities and, and larger towns listed on the Twilight 2000 game map, but how am I going to detail? And then I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hang on, hang on. This is no different from Greyhawk. I don't have to have anything here that I don't want. If I want to say that that city was nuked or that or that town was was destroyed with conventional artillery or that it just doesn't exist in my game, then I don't do it. So I feel like um, there are so many tools more than ever before. I mean, imagine being a DM in 1978. What have you got? Well, you've got... Nothing. Dungeons and Dragons and the World Book Encyclopedia <laughs> to try yep. to try and build a campaign world with and blank and blank uh, hex graph paper. So, um, 
don't be afraid to steal the cool ideas and put them into your campaign world. The good ideas, the persistent fun things will stick. And the lesser ones that your players don't seem attracted to will just fade into the background. And that's that's how you you build the foundation of a campaign world. Definitely. And I would add one more thing too. As a DM who's who's working in the campaign, don't worry if you don't have everything figured out. Um, don't worry if it sucks. Most of the greatest TV shows that have ever come out were not so great in season one, but by the end of season two, they were really picking up. Um, as you sort of see how your players react to your world, you'll have a much better idea on how to proceed. Yes, yes, uh, w- without a doubt. Let me. T- it's a funny meme, but I think this this is this is an ironclad example of how just rolling with it can help you build your campaign world. A guy goes in and um, he, uh, you know, he's he's at his gaming table. And one of his players laughs and said, oh, when you said warehouse for a second, uh, I didn't think you meant a big building full of packages and stuff like that. I thought you meant a person who on a, on a, uh, uh, on a night of a full moon turned into a house and, you know, it's DM frantically scribbling. It is now. Yeah. I, I'm I, I taking mean, some notes for this week. Yeah, yeah, you know, if 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 you get thrown little bits like that, steal from your players too. They'll appreciate it. You know? Yeah. When yeah, yeah. when when the uh the NPC fighter uh you know, the moon comes up and he turns into a uh a two-story 2-3 two, with a uh with a garage and a half, they'll get a kick out of it. Don't be afraid to just borrow from everywhere. Start but if you're just doing it for the first time, I do recommend starting with a pre-made campaign. Not completely pre something like Greyhawk or First Edition Forgotten Realms, where not everything is in there. Because you won't get to do any cool stuff yourself. Yeah. All right. Any other quick tips before we uh uh kill the bastards? Yes. Kill the yes. bastards. Um, uh, when in doubt, none, add murder. Yes. Let none, let none survive. Uh, but that's that's about it. Um, just just and, and have fun doing it. If you're miserable, if you're sitting there and you're like, I don't like my campaign world, and I don't like doing this week to week. Talk to your players. Tell them, look, you know, I thought Greyhawk would be a blast, guys. This is just wearing me thin. You know, if they want to keep their characters but they agree with you that, that it's okay that you shift the game, a magical portal opens up and you find yourself in world X. Yep. And don't feel bad about taking a break. Everybody gets burned out or has real life issues that you need to deal with from time to time. And if you got someone who can step up, I mean, a living campaign world can be the most awesome thing in the world. If somebody wants to, if a player has the chops to be a DM and they want to add to your campaign world and they say, Hey, can I DM for six or eight weeks? They may put a fresh coat of paint in an area that you never considered. And you just, you have an insane amount of fun with. So, so don't, don't be afraid to go that route either. Definitely. So everyone check out the dungeon Delver on his own channel. And I believe you have content five days a week, right? Monday through Friday content, five days a week, Monday through Friday. Hey, some days I have content more than that. Like when I come on the the live streams of wonderful people like yourself. So, well, thank you for coming. Um, And uh, sorry, you also run uh, a professional DMing service focusing on, um, not executive DMing, the uh, corporate uh, DMing. Corporate team building, yes. yes. Uh, uh, it is guide key. Let me see. Uh, you can, uh, if you have an event, if you have a um, some team building that you'd like to do, check us out over at guidekey.com. Uh, we have uh, served as a team building event type company. Uh, for Amazon.
Google.com in recent times. Nice. Um, and they seemed to have a lot of fun. So check us out. If that if that's something that like, you know, you'd like to get yourself and the rest of the IT departments into uh, to play a little to play a little professional D and D, reach out to us. I'll be more than happy to discuss that with you. To me, it seems like this would be fantastic for interdepartmental gaming too, because oftentimes within one department, people are okay, but you always have that other department that you hate. So it seems like getting those departments <laughs> to work together. Stick them in the Tomb of Horrors and tell them nobody gets out until you guys learn to act like a exactly, team. Exactly, exactly. Um, all right, well, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for the questions. Dungeon Delver, thank you very much, and hopefully we'll have you back again. Thank you, sir. I would love to. All right, everyone, uh, if you could click like. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe for more great interviews and videos. And um, head on over to the Dungeon Delver and see what he's got. Thank you, Yang. I had a blast. All right. Good night, everyone.